So I want to welcome everybody uh, today. Uh, we have a few guests with us. We have um, honorary member Dan Hansen. Uh, welcome, welcome back, Dan. We have um, prospective member uh, Stanley Miller. He's joining us today. Uh, we have um, Michael Mack and Melissa Lias, also with us. Um, just a few things as far as Zoom goes. Um, like we normally do, let's go ahead and put our questions in the chat box and I will help moderate the um, question and answer after Matt is done speaking. And, um, and I also, I wanted you to know that um, Dan is recording this uh, program. So Matt, unless you have a problem with that, uh, we're gonna record it and that way, great. Uh, some of our members that weren't able to join us today will be able to watch it. So thank you and welcome, Ron. All right, thank you, Sharon. Welcome everyone to the Rotary Club of Cleveland. I'm Ron Felgenauer and I'm honored to be the 2020-2021 president of our club. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We continue to embrace connecting together uh, virtually. And uh, once again, we have a phenomenal program today. The programs, like I said, this, is, this has been uh, a challenging year but our club has uh, risen to the challenge through all our committees and having just the most incredible programs. Um, like to cover an announcement that um, as a follow-up to an announcement we made at the, our last meeting, by now all of you should have received a, an email with the exciting news about the opportunity George Porter has offered to assist our club in obtaining historical status of 100% Paul Harris Fellowship Club. This would be the first time this has ever happened with a Rotarian club, a Rotary club, where we had 100% Paul Harris Fellowships. And basically, uh, all you have to do is donate any amount that you feel comfortable with. In return, you'll receive the status of a Paul Harris Fellowship, which is equivalent is if you were to give a thousand dollar donation to the Rotary Foundation. And, you know, when we were at the, the districts and seeing, you know, when you go to Rotary International or, and you look at it, uh, what our Rotary International Fund has done is incredible. 92 cents of every dollar goes directly to uh, aiding. And it's, it's the highest rating of any uh, of any charity. So it's one of the most efficient and best uh, charities in the world. So just think about that. Uh, because of the generosity of George and, uh, and the, uh, thank you Nancy, uh, the, the fund, okay, that they have given over $750,000 to Polio, and with that achieved many, many multiple Paul Harris uh, fellowship awards. And he has those that he wants to give it to every member. No matter what you give, you will uh, be a Paul Harris Fellowship. And we really like to see 100% of the club. All you have to do is log into your My Rotary account at Rotary International and make a donation of the Rotary Foundation. The link is in the chat box. Sharon has it. And if you don't know your login information, Sharon can assist you in obtaining it. So if anyone has like questions, how do I do it, whatever, please go to Sharon and she's tracking. We really do want to get 100%. Okay, so we also have a volunteer opportunity this Saturday at the West Park Y. And our community service committee and foundation supported a $3,100 grant to go towards beautifying the area. That's a phenomenal Y. I mean, the Y is a phenomenal organization and uh, that's that location. I grew up in the West Park, so everybody you know knew the, the, the West Park Y. And I think it impacted every everyone in the community. We'll be doing some general gardening work as well. If you're interested, please RSVP to the Rotary office. I'm excited about our speaker today. Haven't seen him in a long time. <laughs> Back in the uh, mid nineties, Matt was actually part of our club. And uh, introducing our speaker today is a member of our program committee, Don Obermeyer. Don is uh, business development director for CISO. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Don. Thanks. Thank you, Ron, and thank you, uh, Matt, for speaking to us today. And uh, we timed this pretty uh, specifically because we're coming into the Summer Olympic uh, season here this uh, this year. 
Um, I had the honor of meeting Matt about six, seven years ago, and uh, he worked for Osborne Engineering, O Sports at the time, in a business development role, and then I uh, got to know him pretty well, and you know, with our companies working together, um, and I got to know him better when he was at Fiorelli, uh, the company there doing business development. But it was kind of ironic and funny that we put things together that when I told my wife after I first met Matt, that I met an Olympian, she's like, oh, really? I've met an Olympian before, too. And she's like, I got a picture of him somewhere. And sure enough, it was Matt. She had met Matt years before we had even met each other. And she took our son, uh, Emilio, to meet him at the South Park Mall. So uh, we became good friends over the past uh, six, seven years. And uh, he's just a great guy. And it's funny because... I have a lot of people that, you know, coworkers and others that are in, very into wrestling. And I didn't realize after I've known Matt for a while that he is wrestling royalty. People are talking about, you know, you know, Matt Gafari, and I've had the opportunity to introduce him to and um, and he's spoken to some of my friends and their kids that are in wrestling. And it's just really cool to see their reactions and, and uh, you know, the impact he has had in the wrestling community over the years. Um, as you mentioned before, he's a, uh, member of our club in the past, an honorary Rotary member, and uh, um, just honored to have him speak here today. And uh, as I said, great friend, a great business development guy. And uh, right now he is looking for another position. So if anybody has that, uh, knows anybody looking for somebody in that realm, uh, he's a great motivational speaker and just a great person on the, the business development world. But I'm just looking forward to hearing more about Matt's story. Um, I was always intrigued that he was born in, uh, overseas in Iran and he was uh, wrestling here for the US. So I'd love to hear the, the whole story that uh, he has to tell us. And I should say too, I'm not gonna be able to stay for the whole program because I'm in another uh, required session. So I'm going to uh, be here for about 15 minutes and I have to step off. So Matt, if you wanna take over and- yeah, Thank you, Don, thank you very much. I get embarrassed when people read my bios up. First, it keeps asking me to give permission to record. I don't know how to do that. I just closed it. Is everything okay with the recording? Okay. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to be here. Uh, there is no greater thing and honor to represent US in battles. Uh, God saves our soldiers representing USA. I used to say before the Iraq and Afghanistan war or Desert Shield was, you know, I was not Macafari. They would say U.S. heavyweight. They used to, my nickname was the battleship. You put a flag on your singlet and you're the U.S. heavyweight. And it wasn't no name. And uh, it was an honor to carry that flag. I used to teach the mentor program, all the young kids coming up. You represent your last name, the city you come from, the state, university, and your country. You go in Poland when it was communism and took a picture at the airport, you will be in jail. That was a military installation. I went to Russia, took Bibles, and they said pornography, drugs, and Bibles are the three things you can't bring to the communism. So things are changed, but to represent US, one wrong thing, could ruin thousands of good thing, good deeds. I remember saying if I had three cups of coffee and went in Olympics, the USA Today headline would say, Matt failed drug testing and two years ban. They don't say why, but there is a big monkey and a lot of people representing USA. And it was important to tell the young kids at the early age to represent your last name, your city, your country, and your school because uh, from US Olympic Committee, US Wrestling, Cleveland State, Case Western, whoever's in my resume, one negative it will be a black mark on their achievements, especially with the social media right now. My story is pretty simple. Uh, my family overcame geographic, political, religious, language, all kinds of barriers. I remember my grandfather had 10 kids, seven boys, three girls. And in the 70s, they were recruiting 10, 11 years old to become fanatics, religious. My grandfather always said, uh, 
politics have no mother and father stick with business. He was a businessman. And uh, he decided to move the entire family to United States. At that time, five of my uncles were at the universities here and he bought a duplex and my father and my mother and my me and my three brothers, no sisters on one side and uh, my grandpa, my grandmother, and one of my uncles on the other side. But uh, in my book, one chapter was dedicated to my grandfather because he keeps talking about, since I was a kid, about Statue of Liberty. Give us your sick, give us your tired, give us your poor. This country, only country that you reap all the rewards and benefits that you accomplish. It is a self-starting country, hard-working country, and don't wait for it. I talked to my kids when they were younger. When I was in Iran, you couldn't go to university. Right now, in many countries, even in Japan, the SAT is almost like a bar, is almost like taking a MCAT. It's so difficult. If you're not from an elite family, you will go to military and you go to work. So having a choice to go to university education was what my grandfather saw the opportunity to succeed. And he also said in America, you have a choice to do whatever you want. Having that choice and liberty is a important part of the attraction. And I remember when I became a US citizen, I missed a couple of Olympics, uh, couldn't try out, but my federal judge told me to make America proud and win a medal. And I said, that's a lot of pressure there, judge. I, I, I just wanna wrestle and let the chips fall where they fall. Uh, Olympics is a very simple motto. It carries in business, five rings equally. You could be a great athlete, great husband, great, community, uh, great Rotarian. So the rings are all equal and makes you balance. That's when you have a bad day in practice or bad match. Uh, the first thing is you wanna go hibernate or you wish you were not in his existing or you feel bad. Uh, I always say it's a funeral or wedding. You win, you can't shut up, you're dancing all night, calling everybody you know, when you lose, you disappear. But the idea of the Olympic rings being all equal means you have to stay balanced. You have to still work because your government don't pay you is like 98% of other Olympians. You have to have a family. As soon as you have a wife, they kick you out of Olympic training center, say, go get an apartment, but don't have a job. And then you have to learn to survive. I worked six months with insurance sales in Cleveland and wrestled six months. I traveled to Russia it was six week tour of Europe. It wasn't like a week or two weeks. So there are a lot of ad adversities and challenges, but the dream, we call it five ring fever. If you want to stand on the podium and there's no sweeter, sweeter music, the national anthem, that's what it drives all our athletes. I drive three hours in the morning, four in the morning, eight o'clock practice in Ann Arbor, then three o'clock practice and I drive back at five and be home at ate for dinner just because we want to train our heavyweight who is a U.S. number one in the U.S., but he's competing this weekend to qualify the weight. If he doesn't win this tournament, in the first time history of USA wrestling, Greco-Roman, we will not have a representation. All days, U.S. can put 10 people out, but starting in 80s and 84, they limit the unlimited weight class to 286 pounds, they, they wanted 18 top-notch people in Olympics. So they like every continent has many qualifiers and some wild cards. Now, if Olympics, it wasn't no pandemic and the Olympics was in last year, now the US heavyweight was qualified. He was second in the world. He was a Pan Am runner-up and two for a Pan American will go. But because of pandemic and all the tournaments being canceled, it was five only tournaments to qualify. And now it's a meat grinder. There is China who's good. There is Norway, Scandinavian. 
there is Bulgarian, there's so many people and only one can go. In Olympics, it doesn't matter uh, if you ill, you get one chance. It's not like swimming or track, you have heat. You get up, you go wrestle, you, have, you win a medal that day, you get hot or you are a tourist and you have to train four years. The story of Olympics is you train all your life. You get a watch and I wear it only occasionally. You get a ring and you get a leather jacket, like a bomber's jacket. If you're lucky, he says your name and he says Olympic silver medalist, 1996. And then most people who don't medal, uh, he, he says, and I'd like to start with this. The most important thing in Olympic games is not to win, but to take part just as the most important thing in life is not the triumph, but to struggle. So the Olympic rings are very subdued in the back, so you can wear to business attire but this is a lifetime achievement. It's like a medal. And his struggle is real. About a handful of Olympians win a medal. If you look at Olymp Olympic participation, is astronomical number to the number of medals they give. And that's why they came with a qualification, so they limit the numbers. Uh, everybody's gonna be tested daily. You have to have a negative test and vaccination papers to fly in. Japan is an island full of older generation. The super scare and uh, wrestling was lucky that when they had Olympic trials and NCAAs, no one tested positive and everybody was vaccinated. They had to move the trials from Pennsylvania to Texas just because in Pennsylvania you only had two coaches in Texas, you could have your family members and a coach like in a bubble each. So it's an important time. Um, another thing I wanted to show you was, this is 92 Olympic picture with all my medals, my cups, US flag, US Olympic thing. And I had three American records and hair at that time, but not Olympic medal. I traded all of these for just one, this to stand and get the Olympic silver medal. My medal's in a safety deposit box. I gave it to my dad. At the Olympics, I put it around his head. If you guys wanna cry, because I only have watched it bits and pieces, Dick Amberg did the Greco-Roman Olympic moment, which is about four Olympians in 1996, who had, I wanna say, heart touching stories. Dennis Hall, his brother died by a drunk driver and he dedicated his medal to it. And my story and a couple of other people and uh, is in YouTube and is very popular. And Dick Amberg's Olympic story is, talks about only way he could thank his father was to put a medal around his neck. And uh, I always joke with him that I had to sign the deal that he's wheeled it back to me when he passes, so I could pass it down to my kids. But, and my mom always says, if he was gold, he wouldn't give it to anybody. But those are the jokes in our family. Um, you train all your life. You know, I talked to Don a little bit about what does Rotarian want to get out of this? The Rotarians are some like a representation of many communities. I call it like a Peace Corps. Um, I was gonna tell Ron, you don't donate, you invest in Paul Harris Foundation. You donate, you eradicated polio. There's a story of me at USA Wrestling, before email, before text, before cell phone, I landed in Sweden in 1986. And I had a Rotarian pick me up, take me shop me, take me to the gym. And people says Matt was connected worldwide because it's snail mail or I used to a telex at that time. But Rotary was the way for me from Colorado Springs to communicate 
with other people because when you land and your interpreter takes you to your hotel, you don't have access to the grocery store or gym. You don't know the local language. So Rotary for me was a international connection. And I remember that uh, I spoke at the Rotary in Kansas City and the governor was there. And we talked about at that time, how communication through Rotary was successful for international travelers. Now with technology, things are changed, but uh, people are still talk about that uh, when Matt got anywhere, there was always a Rotarian meet them at the airport. And I remember that when they interviewed me at the NBC Olympics after I won my medal, and I said, I'm moving to Cleveland, my wife expecting twins, and I'm gonna coach at Cleveland State and join the Cleveland Rotary. At that time, uh, uh, that was my number two goals after buying a house. So things work out and uh, Olympics is uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I am scheduled to be in Atlanta coaching the Olympic team. I've been coaching via Zoom mentoring program. I've been coaching physically, going to Michigan. Uh, mentally, I can wrestle for about 30 seconds, then my body fails. Uh, and uh, we have a team that's getting ready to train in Atlanta and then go to Tokyo, Japan for Olympics. We have to qualify two weight classes. And this weekend, we know if we have a full team or a smaller team. And if they don't qualify, they are US Olympian, but they will not leave the US soil. So is it, it, it is a, a pins and needles time for me this weekend, just because if I have a heavyweight to coach, being an Olympic camp is much fun and uh, Atlanta will be fun. Technology is great. Been doing a lot of motivational talks, videos, and uh, coaching through the Zoom. How, uh, how you can overcome the difficulty of pandemic, no social contact. Uh, I went from business development, traveling almost 50 times percent of my time to being a third grade teacher for my eight and a half year old. And I have to be doing hard stuff. The message is I want my summer dad back. I don't like my school dad. From 8.30 to 2.30, uh, I teach uh, basically men or school as an assistant. And uh, I've been called by my daughter many names when we get to fractions and hard math. And I, I try to balance it all because if she has a play date after a year, she's excited for two days beforehand and reminds me of me and getting ready for big competition. The pandemic, business, all changing, and we have to change with the times. You do the best you can with what you have today. You try to be positive. You got, you know, people are like posting, you know, my mom, my dad's 82 and my mom's eight, is 75. And they do all kinds of posting when they got their shots and pictures and how happy they were. And, you know, then I like I've reminded Terika Pills. It's like, mom. You got your shot, take care of your health. You gotta take your pills. You gotta take your vitamins, you know? So people are becoming health conscious. People are trying to take care of themselves much better. As an athlete, we worked out a couple of times a day and took care of our body and we were in tune because we had to re be ready for competition. Now as a human beings, we see what happens overseas in USA and we in tune with washing our hands. No one's got more cold in our family. Everybody's talking about what a great, you know, no cold, no cough. Yeah, we washing our hands, sanitizing, wearing a mask. Things are helping and he's gonna stay with us. Um, I do a lot of business talks and the idea is how to set goals. And the idea is, uh, as we were talking early before the meeting, having the whiskers or goatee or beard. Hey, number one goal, wake up. You don't wake up, you can't cross off anything. Um, second one, shower, shave. With pandemic, good Lord, if you wanna you know, try to every day do what you used to do. And then try your pants once a week because mine don't fit like December 19. And you know, wearing sweatpants or stretchy pants 
or jeans. I tried to put my suit on and I was like, definitely I need to take an inch off and I need to start harder. I work at, in, at the gym. I have three elliptical treadmill bicycle, but the intensity in the gym and being out and about um, with this pandemic, we do what we have to do. Then we sit down and watch the news and doom and gloom. So we try not to watch the news and stay positive and try to set small goals. Uh, again, wake up, shower, shave, try your clothes on even if you don't go, make up, dress up, move up, and try to get yourself a schedule. I try to do that with my parents, myself. Hey, drop, dropping off recyclables, you know, going, going shopping, you know, once a week with a huge list. You know, is is it is a miracle breaking it down and uh try to just take care of what needs to be taken care of. I do a lot of job interviews through the Zoom right now and, and the difficulty of language barrier or not being in person. I used to be people's people, you shake hand, feely, touchy. Some of those are gone. Now, you know, you just gotta listen twice as much and nod and Got to make sure that uh, all your technologies are updated. You know, before I turn my computer on today at 11 o'clock to do this Zoom, he's doing all kinds of stuff I didn't want him to do. And just got to be ready and prepared. Uh, I can answer any question you have and I could keep going. I, I have many stories to tell you from being at the White House and breaking a historical chair and many other uh, eventful, you know, meet, meeting King of Sweden and getting a watch because the referee uh, didn't give my point. And the King says when the world championship in Sweden, a Swede needs a medal and having an expensive watch, it wasn't enough. I wanted to medal more, but uh, things happen and you just move on. Uh, any questions? There, There is a question in here. Um, from um, oh. Austin, Dean Linden the third. So we went. We always go to the. I've been to the White House more than five times. But after the after every Olympics, the Olympians go to the White House, meet the usually the president and the first lady and the vice president come to the Olympic Games. Uh, in Atlanta, also Senator Dole and candidates came. They were a big delegate. So ninety six was a big political in Atlanta and after Olympics, uh, we went to the White House and usually you have a receiving line, you shake hand, you take a picture, you know, you know, the, the Marine would say, you know, McAfee heavyweight and, you know, from Arizona or Phoenix or for Colorado Springs or Cleveland. And you just save two minutes. And then they have a handful of Olympians who were, I want to highlight it, like Kerry Strug in 96, the gymnast who broke the leg, or a Shaq, who was a big basketball player. And my story was, I wrestled the Russian who never lost, and I lost to them 20 times. And I took him to overtime and almost was an Olympic gold medalist for five minutes. But uh, you can't tie the champ. And you, you know, he won in me stepping out of bounds and uh, having a foul. But uh, and people, I was sad, I cried on the stands because I thought I let the country down. But the media and the people rallied and uh, they said, I I think Ted Koppel said that I fought the good fight and I didn't hear my national anthem and that's what I cried. And, and it was, a, you know, I thought people would react negatively, but it was very positive reinforcement that just do your best and let the chips fall. And after the bombing, I was scheduled to leave because my room was for the other Olympians coming in and uh, Olympics was suspended, but I changed my flight and stayed and tried to um, help put the Olympics back on track. I opened the Olympic Park, visited the bombing victims and traveled uh, with dignitaries and uh, you know, at, at that time, while well, many people coming to to help, and uh, so they wanted to talk to me. So the president, vice president, 
wanted to give me five minutes. So they put me in a green room, which is called Jefferson Library. And the story why it's green is they used to hang the laundry there to dry and it's oxidized the walls. So they didn't touch it, but uh, basically I waited in a laundry room and uh, they told me to sit in this chair. And at the beginning as a big guy, um, me and Bruce Baumgartner, who was a four-time medalist, and uh, and Bruce says he's not going to sit on it. And I say, uh, you know, my knees are sore. I had a long day. I sat on it, and the chair just collapsed and broke. And the guy's face was, oh, oh my God, he's a hundred and seventy year old, you know, I preserve. And a piece of the chair like went through my white shirt, and I was breathing. And I told them that I'm going to sue the White House. Um, but the good, 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 good offense is, I mean, good defense is a good offense. And I said, go get the medical staff. I got hurt. I'm going to sue the White House. I'm going to sue you. Why would you put something here that could harm the Olympians? And we got a big joke out of it. And uh, Bruce Baumgartner's wife writes for AP in Erie, Pennsylvania. So he told the story to her. She wrote it at eerie newspaper i wake up next day and washington post headline is olympic heavyweight destroy the artifact or historical chair so you know and, and of course when i i went to tonight show with jay leno and other show late nights and everybody just picked on that so i i, I became as a man who needs to sit on a metal chair so where I, wherever i went they would bring a metal chair but until this day, I always check the chairs before I sit down because it could happen. Um, I want to know what, what is the next question? There's a, there's a question in there from Dan yeah. Hansen about 9-11. Well, I know I, I'm right now going to the before that. There's about unusual training from Jim. Jim McIntyre is a good guy, by the way. Um, Nice to see you, Matt. Same here. You got the Iron Man hippie goatee going. Um, I it is so funny because I write many different articles for wrestlers. Not in 1991, I landed in. Uh, I had to go to Lake Placid, New York, but there's no airport there. You you land in Vermont. You took a ship across. And you take a van and uh, Burlington. So I, I travel with a medicine ball with the stickers on it, a sledgehammer and mountain bike because our training camps are three or four weeks. So we land in Lake Plaza and I uh, tell the, our guide or our I'm a liaison, need to go to junkyard. He goes, why? So I got to find the biggest, heaviest tire. I said, part of my training is hitting a tire with a sledgehammer, flipping it, jumping on it. As a guy who never had big partners, I have find ways, pushing buses, trucks, pulling. And all of those now is part of CrossFit. <laughs> I, I remember that I, I invented, you know, half of those trainings, but didn't capitalize on it. You know, the, the snatch and clean and jumping on it. But... There were many unusual trainings, and now they're big. Um, Paul, do you have do you have to make weight? Yes. If I wasn't two hundred eighty six pounds, I was a tourist. Um, the problem is, you make two hundred eighty six pounds twice a year. You are two ninety one. They call it two kilo allowance. So all the tournament our allowance two pounds, but Olympic trials, nationals, world championships, you make scratch weight. I used to be in a sauna, not eating and shaving, taking as much as weight possible. I was 286 pounds, maybe for seven minutes because I'd be drinking. Now they do IVs, but you'd be drinking and eating. The Russian I wrestled weighed 296. And he was very lean because a lot of growth hormones and steroids. And he wouldn't eat, but then uh, they would give a lot of IVs to try to get his weight back up. But you have 24 hours to recover. So like a sponge, 
I remember the most weight I lost was 17 pounds in 12 hours. And all you do is you get the water out and then you drink it back up. Um, part of the, okay, this question is gonna be good. But how do you continue to excel mentally, physical stress or training? Could you consider joining our club? Well, always an honorary member because a smaller crop like Manor or Avon Lake where used to be, but the, the, I travel so much, I miss a lot of meetings. And uh, if it wasn't for the Zoom, um, the, the stress is what you put on yourself. God would not give you more than you can handle. The best answer to every athlete, every businessman is a serenity prayer. I carried it with me. If you know what you can control, I mean, and what you cannot control, who do you give your energy to? My best example, Mother Teresa. They asked Mother Teresa to come and munch an anti-war. He says, why would I give my energy to anything that is anti? I will march for pro-peace, but I will not give my energy to anything anti. If you look, and I've been observing politics, and I'm not a political person just because I came from a variety of dictatorships. And, uh, and just look at and people who hate someone and don't hate someone, they give the energy to the wrong person and they're never happy because they're never gonna get exactly what happened. You know, my mom watches every news show and records the ones she can't watch. There's three TVs in her place. And she knows to every minute what's going on. And I say, it doesn't give me anything and I can't control it. There is no way what I can control today here, slamming the table, gonna affect what's gonna happen at the DC. As we learn, then we can manipulate anything. You know, 1996, if someone got up and said, Jim McIntyre is all fake news, people would just think he has to be committed. Now is the norm. And you, if you believe it, you can sell it. And I can lie and say, I got hair. You guys just can't see it. I have lots of hair because I shaved this morning for this meeting. You know, but when I turned 50, my kids brought me mirrors to show me that I'm shaving just to make myself feel good. There's not much back there, you know. But if it's not for your kids, if you know, to keep you honest. All right. There's a good question up here, Matt, a little further that says um, that the Asian Americans are being blamed for COVID, the COVID virus. Do you or did you have um, face any hassles because of your heritage at 911 during 9-11? 9-11, I got problems in 1980s when the hostage crisis. The coach put an O at the end of my name and told everybody I was Sicilian so no one messed with me. <laughs> my program at Cleveland State was Gafario. And I was from the island of Sicily. And I was a big guy. And people would come up and say, let's go beat up some Arabs and some Muslims. It was like, start with me. Uh, there's always hate. There's always racism. There's always sexism. I was the only male speaker at the women's symposium in the Springfield because I have four daughters. And part of sec Title IX they equal scholarships, they recruit women, they came and count shower heads. You know, football has hundreds of scholarships. You gotta find hundred women athletes on scholarship. So they invented sports. And I used to say to them, I don't mind, I don't mind my daughter get scholarship to do fencing or gymnastic or softball, but you're trying to equal men and women scholarship when only 4% of professors are women, let's do that for the professorship. I'd rather my daughter be a professor at the university than be a four-year player. So equal rights. So there's always problems. Um, I can tell you when 9-11 happened, a pro golfer wanted to get off the plane because I was Muslim and I was in first class with him. But People are frustrated. ESPN put me, Hakeem Olajuwon, Muhammad Ali, some 
Muslim athletes on the news, but American people are very reactive. And when they feel like they have to do something, sometimes they overreact. And they're hurting. They don't know what to do. That's the problem. No one has told them how to do what to do. So they hear misinformation. And with the pandemic, everybody got short views. And they're looking for outlet. Uh, what is the best way? Uh, yes. You're right. And that's ended, you know. I don't drink, but many people come in a bar and ask me, you know, uh, you wussed out. You could have beat the Russian. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, let me buy you, you know, let me buy you a beer because you're right. I, I am like that. It ain't worth it. I I rather diffuse. Uh, I tell my, my kids all the time, it takes two to tangle. You know, there there is a problem with our heritage, but Iran needs to hire a good public relations to try to, after they get rid of all the Islamic dictatorships. But, you know, under Obama and Senator Kerry and a lot of things were changing with, with, with 20 years of suppression, you know, they still can't send money over here. They still can't have no embassy you cannot travel. If I have to go there, I owe them two years military service or I have to pay $10,000, which I won't. But there is, is many problems and um, you are never gonna get over it. Um, you just gotta deal with it. What is the next question? I'll let Sharon be the moderator. Read the question so everybody hear it. Um, there's another one that says with the, bi with the bipolar effect you mentioned of of being in a funeral or a wedding, what did you manage or how did you manage those feelings prior to competing? Well, I had a good sports psychologist. You know, after joining Rotary when I came here, I found Dr. Lessig who used to work with the Cavs and help them win the championships also. You need a good, you need a good support team. One of the things, another things about me that is unique was I traveled with my own weightlifting coach, my own wrestling coach, who I helped defect in 1989 communists through Turkey to America to get asylum as a refugee. So you can't beat them, you join them. I stole one of their coaches uh, to become my personal coach. And I always travel with a, with a handful of team support group. Um, I want to say best example I can tell you is when you want to buy something valuable, gold, diamond, stock, you don't want to be wrong. So you ask anybody you trust. So if you want to buy stock, you talk to people who are into stock. You want to buy diamonds, you talk to jewelers. You want to buy gold, you talk to goldsmith. If, if you want to buy land, you talk to neighbors. So the idea that you don't want to make a mistake, you build your support group. So beside the serenity prayer, I had a list. If I win or lose, my family loves me. If I win or lose, sun will come up. You know, I had, I had thoughts that I didn't want to be alive. The competition was so important is do or die because we train do or die. And then I sit in the plane. I'm like, I don't want to go home. I hope the plane goes down and you have 300 people looking at you like, get them out of here, you know? But those thoughts are normal. Billy Mills is the only 10,000 meters gold medal runner for the US. His story was movies, you know, Native American, all kinds of stories. He told me four times in the race, he wanted to quit. He looked for a place that was no cameras or people so he could stop because no American has won the gold. It was hard. And everybody gets thoughts about quitting and everybody gets bad thoughts. You just gotta not do it and reach for your support group. Don Obermeyer is one of my good support group, part of marketing associates and others. And uh, there are a couple other people in business, same. 
you, you surround yourself and then you have blind faith. So we have a wrestler who is not successful, who will get up and come to practice. And when a coach says two hour practice, five minutes wrestling on the mat, two minutes on the feet, five minutes change partners. And he would say, why, why, why are we doing this? Why this is so long? And I made a plan to be an Olympic medalist. For four years, I have to do what's in the plan. Ryan, shine. I, feeling doesn't come into it. And excuse my language, having a stomach virus doesn't come into it. Having a cold doesn't come into it. In Colorado Springs, three feet of snow, I'm running up to Pikes Peak. And my brothers, I said, I'm crazy. Don't I feel like staying at home? I'm like, I set my goals. I made a plan four years backwards, and today I have to do a mountain run. Tomorrow is sprint workout. It doesn't matter if it's Sunday or Monday or raining or hot or cold or whatever. There's a tournament that I go every December in Arctic Circle, Haparanda, where Sweden meets Sweden meets Finland, and it's 100 miles from North Pole, Arctic Circle. Sun comes up two hours. And when you get there, all you want to do is sleep because it's dark and cold and jet lag and they got good wine and, you know, it's it's hard. You have to put yourself saying, hey, the gym in Cleveland is the same as the gym in North Pole. The fluorescent lights or bulbs are the same. I mean, you watch the movie Hoosiers, the guy has a measure of court to tell him nothing has changed. We put parameters on ourselves mentally and we make it more difficult. If you fit, figure what the task is and walk the steps backwards like an architect, then you know what you need to do. Hey, it's Mother's Day. It's gonna be hard to buy flowers with pandemic. I went and bought four today before this meeting because when I go to Sam's Club or Giant Eagle or anywhere, I get the bad roses and hey, I had to make a plan that be a shower and shave before I do that. So I'd be ready for rotary. And when I turned the TV on, I wanted to watch the morning Joe and I know I'm gonna, hey, slow down and it ain't gonna work for me. So today was no TV. Get up and hit the list. Uh, next question. Go ahead, Sharon. I don't see any other questions in the chat box unless somebody has one that they have not put in. Do you have a chiropractor? Chiropractors are awesome. I have two of them. And uh, the problem with chiropractor is I sit on the ball, it's right here. And I crack my own back and everything. But the problem is you try to make a left turn for me and I turn too quickly, then I can't look left for a while. So I have to go in emergency. But regular maintenance, having a masseuse, you know, right now with pandemic is hard. Taking care of your body. You know, Emmett Smith said that he used to get acupuncture, massage, acupuncture, massage, acupuncture, massage, acupuncture, massage, alternating. Just because of to be ready after practice, before practice. So there are a lot of people who do many things, having a good masseuse, having a good chiropractor, I tell people after I retired in 2000, yoga saved my life. I was overweight. I worried about how people thought. I worried about my all the baggage. I went into yoga and I didn't know anything. And then my teacher was, the voice is very important, finding a good coach. Says, if you hold your breath and if you look, look around, you're not doing yoga, you lost it. This is not a competition. Yoga is go inside. If your muscles, your stomach is tight. If your knees hurting, you modify everything. You don't do what's next to you, to the left, to the right, or the teacher. You modify, go inside, take a breather. Don't do nothing but sleep. Unplug. Leave your phone outside in the world. My twins had an accident and they paged me. I was in a yoga zone for an hour. I was out of it. And then the police had to come get me. Nothing major but no one knew the insurance or anything. But for one hour, I didn't care. 23 hours for everybody else. One hour, I go inside, try to find out what's really bothers me. 
And, it, and most of us know the answer. If a stranger comes up to you with the same problem you have, you will have the correct answer, but we will not act on it because we have other issues. It will take my mom three days to settle a misunderstanding before grandkids where I get them all in a FaceTime. I say, hey, we have two minutes. This is what it is, you know? Uh, wrestling is the best sport. Well, wrestling is the oldest sports known to man. They found drawing in the caves and the technique that is drawn, we use it up to this day because you grab a torso, the head or the arm, the body hasn't changed. Greeks and, Greeks and Romans used to wrestle to death. Uh, there is a plate here that Gaudi did before Barcelona Olympics. That's the original model of wrestling, which is like MMA. But Greeks would send, I think at the movie Troy, you saw it, where one side send the champions, the other side send the champions, one kills the other one and the war's over, someone won. But Greg Roman used to be like that, but they changed the rules, thank God. Um, Thank you, Matt. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I, I can talk all day. I have many things to say, but I want to make sure everybody gets something out of it. What is the most important thing in Rotary? We take care of community, fellowship. I used to love the clam bake. Uh, I used to have still a bunch of Rotarian come over my house, having friends and finding is, you know, I remember the university, the old, the old building, the whole atmosphere. And I remember going down the windows in the river, the change was very hard for me. I like the old ways, hard to get used to the new ways. Now with the Zoom is the same thing. We, we, just, we just cowboy up and move on. Uh, you get out of life what you put into it. You can decide to be happy with whatever. My wife likes all this crystal we never use, but she's happy. And... Uh, I call it the museum. Some of them I brought from overseas, but you know, everybody's different. We talked early on about collection. I was in an airplane coming to America, 13 years old by myself, going to high school and wanted to buy my host. I was living with American family in a duty-free plane, a necklace. I turned around to the guy next to me. I don't know what nationality he was. I said, is this worth 50 bucks? He said, son, if, if it's worth to you a million dollars, a hundred dollars, or worth two dollars, it's up to you. Because to me, I won't even look at it. It won't worth a cent. You can give it to me, I throw it out. I, it, it just, what's up to you? What is it worth to you? You know, to some people, stamps are big. They might pass it down, you know? I collect a lot of medals because I was wrestling. I got into coin collecting uh, because of silver, gold, bronze, and it, it's just a game. I, I know that uh, we are all hoarders. It's hard to get rid of things because we have emotionally tied to it. When when uh, Tony was talking about he has to go from three rooms to one room, it's hard to get rid of stuff. But what are we going to do about it? Uh, get a storage? Save it? Uh, my father has the best thing. He starts giving money out, saying, I want you to see you guys to spend your inheritance. I don't want to be dead. And you guys saying, oh, what a great dad he was. He left us money. What do you need? You need a car? Here's your inheritance. I keep track of it. Uh, you know, my father and my grandfather were my heroes. I never could live up to what they did. Uh, my uh, grandfather moved the family here uh, with two suitcases. My dad came here. They were wealthy businessmen, friends of the Shah, but everything was going to get seized. And, you know, I have a graduation tomorrow for three of my daughters. One is a doctor from OU, one is a master's from Kent, and one graduated last year, but I'm celebrating it this year because of the pandemic. So here's a wrestler who was the first one in the family ever to go to college. His two brothers are doctors. His other brother is a scientist, Geno Research Masters, 
things I can't talk about. And then my kids who were born here, first generation America, are all graduated. And I keep saying to my dad, not bad for a wrestler, you know? Uh, my dad left ninth grade to work with his father. I, I got a scholarship for wrestling two years at Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey because Cleveland State had a heavyweight. And then when he left, they gave me a scholarship. I moved here. Things like that. I know the time's going long and I, I'm excited because all of you guys are friends and all of you guys have a, a life as unique. It's just how you frame it. Very well said. You know, it's, it's, uh, th thank you. Thank you, man. Oh, I, I'll that's tell you that. The school. Round of applause. You know, the serenity prayer, you're right. That's, it's such a simple but powerful prayer. And it's a, you're right, when it comes to stress, so much, so many times it's self induced. I just love your passion. It comes through and the, uh, the love you have for this country as well. And uh, that, and, uh, and the fact that, you know, it's really setting goals and self-discipline. So many times you came across sharing that, you know, a lot of people said the goals without, uh, uh, without setting goals are just dreams. Yeah, if goals without deadlines are dreams. You That's have to right. put a exactly. time and a date. If it's not ending, then... But I want to say one last thing, which is very important. Okay. Everybody wants to know why people come to America. I, I interviewed refugees on the boat with zero dollars. Russians, Hungarians, Moldavians. If they go into store in Moldavia, Russia, or Cuba, it's empty. In America, even if they have no money, when they go to store, the stores are full. And they have dream of having money and going to store buying something. My Russian coach who defected here, first day bought $400 from grocery store because he thought first of the month, the grocery store's full and they will not restock it to next month. He had to find people put stuff in the refrigerator because he thought they're gonna run out. He didn't know that every day is the same. And a month later, he would send his wife walking every day to the store because he wanted fresh stuff every day and. And that was an exercise. That is a great story. There was a, a commentary on, uh, if you said, if you want to know what country to live in, and there's someone talks about the, you know, one system over another, whatever. The gentleman used that story. He said, go into that country's grocery, go into the country's grocery stores and see what you see. Yeah, so you want to know how the economy is? Price of milk. You yeah. go to Hawaii, $6. One gallon of milk. I coached in Hawaii and they, the guy has three jobs because he wants to surf. Everything's flown in and everything's expensive. In Japan, a McDonald's will cost you $100. <laughs> so in Cleveland State, when I wrestled, our pre diem was $16. I did an event in Japan. They gave me $1,200, $100 a day for meals. And I was like, Good Lord, I'm taking money home. I got two Big Mac and a coffee and I think an ice cream or fries and it was $130. I went back, gave him the money and I said, I can't afford to eat here. That was one meal and I blew my hole. So it's an island. So you wanna know the economy? Go buy milk and bread. That's what yeah. our politicians don't know. No one has bought anything for themselves lately. Who makes decision? Peace. Well said. Well, once again, we had a phenomenal program. And next week, uh, let me go through here one second. We have Robbie Simons, professor and chair of urban studies at Cleveland State. We'll be speaking about driverless vehicles. Did you ever think we'd have a program on that? I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty darn exciting. I mean, if it was said five years ago, you know, it's, a, it's like some out of the Jetsons. But I will be speaking about driverless vehicles, and this will be another great program. Once again, it's more important than ever to remember that this year's Rotary theme is uh, Rotary Opens Opportunities. And with that, um, 
This meeting is adjourned. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers on the call and uh, to everyone uh, that's on the call to their mother as well. God bless you all and God bless you, Matt. Thank you so much. Loved your stories. Thank you, Matt. Bye.